far side of the car park opposite the staff entrance. Uh, so please could uh, everybody turn off their mobile phones and um, any alarms or, or set them to uh, silent or vibrate. So to start the meeting, my name is Councillor Bridget Smith and I'm the leader of South Cambridge District Council and I'm the chair of this cabinet. So for the information of members of the public, the cabinet is made up of myself and seven lead cabinet members. That's our test alarm. For that, that's not a fire alarm. That's the uh, the routine Monday morning test. That was good timing. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, cabinets made up of myself and seven lead cabinet members, and the cabinet's responsible for most council services, for preparing a budget, and for the council's major policies and strategies, which are then considered by full council, which consists of 45 people. Uh, so I won't introduce um, cabinet members when they speak. You'll uh, you'll get notification of who, the, who they are. Uh, so I can co confirm that the meeting is for it. Um, so I've got lots of notes here, and I'm just trying to see which ones are worth saying. So public speakers and others, such as officers, may either be present in the chamber or addressing the meeting by video conference. Some may be watching the webcast. Uh, so please be patient as we learn to use the new technology. This is only the second time we've done it. And this follows the end of the temporary legislation, uh, which allowed public meetings to be held entirely by video conference. Um, and all voting members now must actually be in the same room. So if you're not physically in the meeting and you're a cabinet member, then you can't actually, uh, you can't vote. Um, so other councillors are joining the meeting online to participate in the debate, and we're very pleased that they've done so. Um, and so it's clear to members of the public a committee member proposing or seconding a motion or voting must be in the room. Okay. So, uh, if I could just move, move on to the meeting, can I just, um, well, I, can, I know we've got Councillor Grenville Chamberlain here because he's, uh, he's appearing large on the screen. Um, I don't think we have, uh, do we have Councillor Judith Ritter, who's the Vice Chair of the Scrutiny and Overview? We don't today. Okay. Uh, thank you. So I'm very pleased they're here because they will be reporting on the work of our very competent scrutiny and overview committee. Uh, can I also check whether we've got um, Councillor Pippa Halings and Councillor Jeff Harvey present, who are the chair and vice chair of the Climate and Environment Committee? Are they present, please? Not yet. They're probably, going to, they're probably going to join later in the meeting because the item they're going to speak on is, uh, is later on in the agenda. Uh, so we have a number of uh, officers from our senior leadership team present and we'll introduce them if and when they speak. So starting off, uh, item two is apologies for absence. Uh, Jonathan, what apologies for absence do we have, please? Thank you, Leader. We have received apologies from Councillor Peter MacDonald and the uh, Vice Chair of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee Judith, Councillor Judith Ritter. Thank you. Is anybody aware of any other? I think Councillor Judith, yes, uh, sorry, Councillor Peter Fain, I think, has also sent apologies, if those two noted. That's, he's obviously not a cabinet member, but uh, was hoping to attend. Is anybody aware of any other apologies for absence, please? No? Thank you. So moving on to item three, which is declarations of interest. So do any members have interest to declare in relation to any item of business on this agenda. If an interest is sub subsequently becomes apparent later in the meeting, would you raise it at that point? So I will kick off. Um, I need to declare an interest in item nine as I am a, a landlord. I let out a property. Uh, Councillor John Williams. Thank you very much. If you could activate your microphone when you speak, that'd be great. So th there's been noted. Any other de declarations of interest? Councillor Bill Handley. Um, Chairman, can we point out to you that those of us taking part online cannot hear the people who are speaking who you apparently can? For example, we could not hear John Williams just now. Thank, thank you. So, that, so we, members, you need to pr activate your microphone in order for the people who are um, coming in remotely to, to hear what you're saying, please. So Councillor John Williams made the same declaration that I did for item nine, 
that he is a landlord in South Cambridgeshire. Councillor Bill Handley declared that though he is a landlord, it's not for any property within South, within South Cambridgeshire. Um, if you want to speak, please, and you're not physically in the meeting, what are we doing? Are we doing people putting, as people, what, how, are we, how, are they, are they, how are we notifying? Um, so we've got quite a lot of people, we can only see some people. It would, yes, if you would put it in the chat, please. And Councillor Bill Handley will monitor the chat and he will notify me of who wishes to speak in the order at which they in the order in which they have indicated they wish to speak. So if you wish to speak, but I understand Councillor Bradman, that needed to be brought to our attention urgently. So if you could just put in the chat and Councillor Bill Handley will uh, wave at me from in front of me here and tell me that somebody wishes to speak. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Um, so, we've noted the declarations of interest, Jonathan? That's it. Yes, we have. Okay, so moving on to the minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, members are asked to approve the minutes of the meeting, which was held on the 24th of May. I move the approval of those minutes as a correct record. Is there, is there a seconder for that, please? I think it's Councillor Neil yep, Goff is seconding. I will second that, um, Are there any issues arising from those minutes that any... Body wishes to any cabinet member wishes to raise. Does anybody else wish to raise any issues of clarification or accuracy of the minutes? No. In which case, uh, do members agree to approve the minutes? Sorry, Councillor. Sorry, sorry, I beg your pardon, Councillor Bradman. I'm sorry, we missed. It was slow arriving in chat that you wished to speak. Would you like to speak now? Leader, thank you. Sorry, I apologise. I was slow in typing. I just wanted to check whether um, Dem Services could check whether Councillor Jeff Harvey was in attendance in the council meeting at last cabinet, because I thought I, I thought he possibly was taking part online. But I might be mistaken, so I just wanted to check. Could they check that? We'll we'll check that. I kind of Thank think you. he was in. I kind of think he was here in person, but we will double we will double check that. Thank you very much indeed. All right. So, do members approve? Agree to approve the minutes? Thank you. Anybody wish to vote against? And anyone wish to abstain? Okay, so Cabinet therefore agrees the approval of the minutes as a correct record by affirmation. And moving on to item five, public questions. I'm not aware that we've received any public questions. Jonathan, can you confirm that, please? Thank you. No public questions were received ahead of the meeting. Thank you very much. And moving on to item six, which is issues arising from scrutiny and over overview committee. Uh, Councillor Chamberlain, do you want to speak now or do you want to speak within the body of the meeting? Uh, Leader, if I may, I'd prefer it to speak now, if I may, as uh, I have to leave home shortly for another commitment. So um, my comments will be brief. The uh, summary that's been put together by young Mr. Senior is uh, extremely comprehensive, but I would just draw your attention to a couple of points. Um, on page seven under point three, the second um, bullet point, we do believe that the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government should be urged to clarify against which standard performance should be measured just to ensure consistency and comparison of like with like. Uh, the use of extension of extensions of time to ensure quality of application should be taken as evidence of officers being as thorough as possible. Under the private sector housing policy, I think the main point that I'd like to draw to Cabinet's attention is that the, uh, with the potential workload, it would be important for staffing levels and expertise, though sufficient now, to be reviewed from time to time. And then finally, under quarter four performance, um, we're delighted to hear that a new tele telephony system will allow a callback, uh, enabling more efficient access of residents to the service. And I'm, I'm happy to take any questions, Leader, but with, um, with your permission, I will uh, end there and leave you in due course. Thank you. 
Thank, thank you very much indeed. And they are indeed very comprehensive minutes from uh, Mr. Senior, and we're very grateful for those. Uh, would any cabinet member like to ask any questions of clarification of Councillor Chamberlain? No. Anybody else in the meeting like to question Councillor Chamberlain? No, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take those are very important points you've raised. We will take the, we will take those forward. And as always, we thank the scrutiny of the overview of the committee for the uh, the considerable uh, effort that they put in to uh, to their roles. Much appreciated. And thank you for attending, Councillor Chamberlain. Thank you, Leader. Uh, right, so we're now moving on to number seven actions taken under the Chief Executive delegated powers. Um, and we're just asked to note this note this report. Okay. So moving on from noting, yeah, okay, to item eight, which is the quarter four performance report. And Councillor Neil Goff, uh, the deputy, is going to report on this in the first instance. Thank you, Leader. Um, I'm going to be very, very brief. Um, as Councillor uh, Chamberlain is well aware, we had a, a, a very good discussion on this at scrutiny and oversight. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'll just make a, a couple of points uh, relating to areas of performance which uh, fall into my uh, area of responsibility. And then um, I, I expect that sort of other cabinet members may wish to either say something or respond to any questions that arise. Um, so as Councillor Chamberlain said, you know, one of the obvious um, uh, points in the report uh, was the performance of the, uh, of the contact centre, particularly the um, length of time that was taken to answer calls. Uh, we had a good discussion of scrutiny and oversight, but this is really a function of uh, demand um, in that the call centre can really cope if calls are of the order of 600 calls a day. Um, the staff is, is sufficient to uh, deal with that. But as soon as the calls start to increase, as is uh, often the case around certain times of the year, for example, council tax, uh, received council tax statements and so forth, as soon as the calls go above sort of 700, 800 calls a day, um, it's very difficult to for the staff to cope and, and to get back up uh, in terms of the answer time. Um, as uh, Councillor Chamberlain said, one of the things we're looking at, and it is one of the things we're looking at, is the introduction of a callback service, uh, which is apparently enabled by the new technology. Um, that's, that's good. Uh, Mr. Membry will be um, looking at this. It's not quite as simple as it seems because even though you have a callback facility, you've still got to find the time within the system to call people back. Um, so it needs uh, a bit of process um, associated with, with that. And that will be looked at in parallel with things, other things we talked about, about um, online chat capability, which increases the ability of uh, call center staff to deal with a number of calls. So uh, there's a number of things there which, uh, which will be looked at. So um, I will I will stop there. I don't know whether any other cabinet members wish to take a point. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Councillor Goff. So you're going to move the recommendation. I, need, I believe that Councillor John Batchelor is going to second the recommendation. Uh, would, you, would you like to speak on this, Councillor Batchelor? Yes, please, uh, Chair. Uh, I'd just like to speak to the um, housing uh, reform elements uh, in my role as a lead member for housing. This is on page 21, and there are three um, items of concern there. The first one was the spend on bed and breakfast accommodation, which uh, in the year came out just under £260,000, uh, as against the target of £124,000. Um, this is all uh, COVID-related. Um, and the good news here is that uh, the government did actually provide um, uh, grant support in this area, and it should also be noted that most people in this category uh, qualify for benefits which come, come to us as well. So in fact, over the year, the cost for South Cambridge was 27,800. 
Um, we're obviously keeping this under review in that uh, numbers are still remaining high um, relative uh, to this district. Um, and we will report back on, on that later. The second item is responsive repairs and attendant satisfaction. Um, this has been a concern to us for some time because the system has been up till now to, for the contractor to ask for the satisfaction from the client when he finishes the job. And in many cases, this is um, thought to be oppressive. Um, so we are reviewing this uh, to come up with a, a different system of actually um, gathering satisfaction. Uh, underlying this, of course, uh, the, we have had concerns that satisfaction numbers coming back from contractors didn't seem to reflect the uh, level of complaints that we're actually receiving from the tenants and the quality of the work. So again, that, that, that is under review. On the third item, which is the average time to relet a housing stock, is really the most concerning area. And this um, comes back to the amount of time that voids are taken to be filled. So the first thing to say is that this is January, February, and March, and we're at the height of the lockdown, which caused considerable issues uh, for contractors um, getting on with the work. Uh, another side effect of COVID was that we weren't able to carry out the usual handover procedures and quite a number of properties were received back in very poor condition. So we have um, many more major works required than we normally do. Um, the contractor has had difficulty with staffing uh, and in view of this we've taken the steps to take away um, all the major void work from them and given them to, uh, to other contractors so that they can concentrate on the minor works and start to get the stock as quickly as possible back uh, into circulation. Um, there's various other steps being taken, um, which includes a weekly meeting of senior staff with the contractors to review every single void property to see exactly where they are on them uh, and to deal with any issues that might be occurring. So I hope I can give some reassurance that these matters are in order. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Right, uh, Councillor Brian Milnes. Uh, thank you, my leader. I think the um, a couple of things about the um, uh, reportage that um, doesn't really acknowledge the difficulty of individual cases and the impact that we have on on residents, for example. So, speaking to uh, what uh, Councillor Bachelor uh, said about voids and so on, or uh, responses from contractors that let our residents down occasionally. So although there might uh, be a figure in the KPIs, understanding the difficulty over you know, several weeks, for example, in my case of a piece of case work where um, somebody was let down, they didn't make the first appointment, they stopped in, um, took a half a day off work to be there, didn't turn up. And it's, it, it, it's that sort of um, 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 episode that's very difficult to monitor in, in here but really you know, impacts individuals, but also puts, puts us at you know, risk of uh, reputational damage. And so I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that uh, the Councillor Bachelor is uh, on the case in that uh, regard. And the other thing that I think that I'm conscious of in, in the report, there's, there's, there's um, cases of um, handover uh, from one uh, call centre number to another. So after, uh, 4.30 or 5.30 or whatever the time is, you, you're asked to go to another number or, um, so I think in, in our case we've got um, Penn and all, no, East, East Hams I think, looks, looks after our call services. And sometimes there's a gap uh, between, between those two. So you can't get one 
or the other to answer. So there were, those, and as I said, it, it, that may be in here, but the impact on somebody who's got something of an emergency uh, is significant. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention, because it was raised at full council uh, earlier in the year, was the LED program. Um, and I'm pleased to be able to say that the snagging work is almost complete on that. So we, we had uh, some issues with UK power networks who classed um, uh, the um, electricity supply at risk, so it was unsafe to connect to new. Uh, we've also had some uh, concrete uh, pillars uh, alongside uh, new ones that haven't been removed. So they're, they're in hand now. And out of the 1,600, I think we're down to about 30 uh, snagging, and that will get resolved very, very soon. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, any other cabinet member want to comment? No? Have we, uh, Councillor Handley, do we have any questions for anyone else? All right. So I'm really pleased with this. I think it's, a, it's nothing short of a miracle that uh, we've maintained our performance as well as we had in the face of a pandemic. And actually, we've done it all the way through. You know, we've, I think the council's been extraordinarily successful at, in keeping business as usual going. And, um, you know, where things are read, it's, it's very understandable why they're read, but it's very reassuring to hear from Councillor Batchelor and Councillor Mills that uh, we're not just saying there's a problem, there's absolutely, a, you know, a fast and furious piece of work in place uh, to, to, resolve, to resolve problems. So I think, you know, my congratulations to um, our Chief Executive and to all her colleagues for, um, you know, for main, main actually managing to improve performance in the face of a pandemic and I don't imagine there's many councils that have, uh, have managed to achieve that so thank you very much indeed from all of us so we are asked to let me just find my paperwork um, so the recommendation is set out at paragraph four of the report and cabinet, cabinet is recommended to review the KPI results and comment at Appendix A and progress against the business plan actions at Appendix B, which is very nicely set out. Thank you very much, officers, for that. Uh, and where appropriate, any actions required to address any issues identified. So do members agree with the proposal? Anyone wish to vote against? And anyone wish to abstain? Thank you. So Cabinet therefore agrees the proposal by affirmation. And moving on to a, a pretty major piece of work, the private sector housing policy. And Councillor Brian Mills is going to introduce this, and I believe Councillor John Batchelor is going to second it. So over to you again, Councillor Mills. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. So this is a piece of work that uh, was left required by government legislation that we had a policy for uh, the private housing sector um, and to uh, make sure that um, tenants uh, sector were protected uh, from inappropriate uh, activities um, by, by land, landlords. Um, and you'll see uh, before you, and again, this got a very good airing at Scrooge and in overview, so I don't particularly want to um, go through uh, all of that again. And, and in that respect, uh, we did take um, accommodation of uh, the suggestions that were made, for example, by Councillor Richard Williams in terms of some of the um, work that was, um, uh, some of the wording, uh, excuse me, and, and also the formatting. So uh, we're asking today to, to have delegation to make further minor changes to that so that the layout and so on are, 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 is uh, well done. Um, and I'll thank particularly uh, the officer, um, Leslie Beavers, for uh, producing this uh, uh, document, which is very comprehensive. Um, it's based largely on work that has been, uh, has been done at Nottingham City Council. Uh, so we, we have got a system that is tested um, and uh, has been uh, successfully deployed there. Uh, so I'm very happy to recommend this report to you and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to respond to uh, Councillor Chamberlain's um, question about making sure that there's the staffing and the expertise for you know for this to be implemented really? Well, actually, the, the the manifestation of this document before you is there uh, as demonstration that we've got more resources to put into place. So we have vacancies uh, that needed to be filled before we were able to uh, bring this forward to you. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm more than happy that we have the resources in place to uh, to manage this process. Ex excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Um, are there any questions or points from members of Cabinet? No. Uh, Councillor Handley, have we got any questions from anybody else? No. Right. Uh, okay. So, um, Councillor John Batchelor, you d did you want to speak on this? Um, no. Th thank you, Chair. A very good report. Happy to endorse it. Thank you very much. I mean, I have in the past had to um, ask the council to intervene over a private um, housing matter, and they did so brilliantly. And um, I had some very, very, very happy, happy family as a result of it. But it's very good to see this embedded in this, in this very, very clear way. So uh, huge thanks for the officers responsible for it, because it is an excellent piece of work. Thank you also to Nottingham City Council, um, who I gather have been uh, hugely influential. And it's, it's good to hear that they've tested this out. So we know that this is a model that, that works. Uh, thank you. So um, the cabinet is the recommendation set out at paragraph three of the report, which is on page 46. Uh, and cabinet's recommended to A, approve the private sector housing policy to ensure the council follows guidance from the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government to tackle substandard conditions in the private rented sector, sector and B, delegate authority to the head of shared waste and environment make minor amendments in consultation with the lead cabinet member for environment services and licensing. So do members agree with the proposal? Does anyone wish to vote against? And does anyone wish to abstain? Very good. So cabinet therefore agrees the proposal by affirmation. So moving swiftly on uh, to item 10, officer delegations for infrastructure projects, and we are just asked to note this so that it doesn't need to be um, seconded, uh, but Councillor Toomey Hawkins is going to introduce the report. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, uh, as we all know, our district um, is facing a number of new national infrastructure projects over the coming years. Um, most, uh, the most recent example we have consultation on was East West Rail. Um, but whilst we are not the body that's responsible for giving consent, we are nevertheless consultees and we will be participating in the processes leading up to the uh, consent by government through either the development consent orders or transport work orders. And of course, this matters do not follow our normal planning processes as we have set out in the paper that you have before you. It's therefore important for us to have in place a proper process whereby the council can respond uh, within the time frames which sometimes are usually tight and not within our control. And what we propose to do is that some of those issues obviously will be down to cabinet to determine as you see in paragraph 3.11 and others of the more operational nature will be determined, be proposed by the Joint Director of Planning and Economic Development as in paragraphs 3.12. Uh, obviously, the overall approval of matters still fall to the Council. Um, however, um, well, not however, I guess, really all I'm asking is that you approve the proposal we set out, um, giving the Director of Joint the Joint Director of Planning and Economic Development, the authority delegated from Cabinet to respond to specific stages in the matters associated with infrastructure delivery in our district. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. Um, as I said, we don't, we're just being asked to note this. Uh, any Cabinet member would like to comment on this? No, anybody outside of Cabinet? Oh, oh sorry, Councillor Bradman like to speak um sorry thank you leader i i just wanted to check i'm sorry it was to do with the previous item and i just wanted to check that under um the item we were not only you were not only approving the um housing element but also the penalties element which were appendices a and b because they're two set they were two separate documents in the scrutiny and overview papers and we've actually in the pet in i have a printed copy of the agenda and the housing element was printed twice but i think you received the penalty as a separate item 
and I just wanted to check that both A and B are included in your previous approval. Uh, Councillor Brown Mills. Yes, actually, I think the um, the duplication. Did you say penalties were duplicated? It was the. Um, it was, just it, bear it, with me. It was the. It was the penalties that was that were duplicated, and we didn't have the body, the appendix A. We got two copies. That's, that's yes. right. It, we, remedied, one of the things, we, we remedied that, Councillor Bradman. Okay, so one of the things I wanted to just ask about that was whether whether it would be wise to make the naming of those two documents clear because they are confusing enough to have confused the people producing the agenda. Do you see what I mean? Um, they're both they're both called private sector housing policy. Um, so one's called the private sector housing policy, but the second one was called the civil penalties procedure. And but the documents look very similar. And I just wanted to check that the civil penalties procedure didn't only cover housing policy, it covered all sorts of other things as well. So you need to be sure that that is also approved. I, th I think if I can uh, say that it was um, clarified before the cabinet meeting with cabinet members that there had been that duplication of appendices that you've mentioned. And it is clear in the, um, uh, 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 the motion or whatever we should proposal <laughs> that, that both of these policies were included so I'm I'm content that we have uh, done this properly if anybody else wants to make a, an alternative su suggestion I'm happy to take that on on board um, and I'm pleased that they looked uh, very similar documents because that was one of the suggestions from scrutiny that we get the formatting properly done Thank you. If, can I just bring in Leslie, who's the officer who's been leading on this, please? Thank you. I was just going to say that the, the they are two separate documents, but it was all included in the one report to Cabinet. The civil penalties pick up if we have to take enforcement action on private sector housing. So the civil penalties referred to in this document is purely for private sector housing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, clarif that clarification. Right. So, moving back back on to where we where we were, uh, which was agenda item ten, which was the officer delegations for infrastructure projects. Are there any? So, cabinet members have already indicated that they've nothing else to add here. Is there anybody else who would like to uh, ask a question? No. Okay. So, I think this is a very useful paper actually because it absolutely highlights you know, how complicated things are in South Cambridgeshire and that we are dealing with some really, really big and significant issues. And I, I imagine more so than any other district of comparable size in, in the country, quite honestly. And I've had various conversations with parish councils recently where, you know, they are, some parish councils are finding this overwhelming and we're having conversations about how we can uh, keep our parish council better informed about what our role as the district council is because obviously an awful lot of this stuff we are merely consultees you know we don't have ultimate control over them um, but i think we need to get we need to be clearer still about what our role is and what we're actually doing so uh, it's, a, it's a helpful paper on uh, on many levels so um we're just noting this so oh sorry so councillor bradman you want to come back in on this one Thank you. Sorry, Leader. Uh, it takes a while. There's a delay on the line. Um, I just wanted to be clear that in this paper, we are recommending at uh, point 2.1 on page 118 that the Joint Director of Planning and Economic Development has the authority for, for, for providing responses at specific stages of these um, consultation processes um, and I just wanted to be clear whether the members have an opportunity to understand what that response will be before it is made in other words for example it would be um, at the very least useful for members to know 
whether, for example, the Joint Director of Planning and Economic Development was going to give a response that favoured one part of the district over another. Now, that might be by necessity, but members need to know whether that's going to happen. Uh, I'm going to bring in Stephen Kelly, the Director of Shared Planning. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I think the the it certainly wouldn't isn't an intention that we favour one part of the district uh, or another in any in any response. There would be a, a record of a decision that's made, not least in terms of a matter of public record in the submission that the council um, uh, makes to the process. Uh, if local members, uh, as you've noticed in the report, the, the consultation period for some of these responses and the statutory requirement to respond or it effectively face uh, a, a scenario where our response is, del is not uh, recognized uh, is quite tight. Uh, and obviously, as these projects progress, what I would hope is that local members uh, and the planning service uh, and, and officers uh, would continue to engage in uh, ensuring that your understanding or your issues raised by anything that you see coming forward are captured in our, in our response. Uh, but this is a practical um, a, a approach uh, that we're seeking to note uh, to ensure that South Cambridgeshire District Council's voice is heard throughout the process. Uh, and my intention and my team's intention would always be to try and understand local members' perspectives uh, in framing those responses uh, in the normal way. Thank you very thank much, you. Mr Kelly. Uh, yes, Councillor Bradley. So, thank you, uh, Leader. I, so, I take that to mean that if, for example, the Joint Director of Planning felt it was necessary to make a, a, a recommendation that might um, influence precisely where, uh, you know, up until now, the responses have been very neutral. And, but if in the future, a, a, re a response was felt necessary that might see a piece of infrastructure being put in a particular location, would he, I understand him to mean that he would always consult with the local members first. So, uh, thank you, Councillor Bradley. I'm going to bring in our Chief Executive, Liz Wills. And sorry, I, Chair, I didn't see Stephen's hand was back up, but I know what Stephen is going to say is that if you look at 3.12, uh, what we are um, noting is that uh, the Joint Director of Planning has quite a lot of process responsibility to making sure that, the, that any consultation gets through the process and that we can do that in a timely way. But of course, any content in terms of our uh, response to anybody would certainly be informed by, by members um, in the usual way as it has been so far. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope you know, Councillor Bradman, that we bend over backwards to consult with all members on all, on all key issues. Uh, and we do that uh, through formal meetings, through informal meetings, through presentations, through workshops. And I think we probably do far more than uh, very many other, other councils do in order to keep all of our membership and our parish councils extremely well informed and to make sure that we are reflecting their voices. One example of this is our response on East-West Rail con uh, con uh, contained a huge appendix, which, wa which was all the emails, and there were many of them, which I had received from residents and parish councils and lobby groups and so on, um, you know, on what their views were on East-West Rail. And we included that appendix so that it could be cross-referenced to make sure so that people would see that we had clearly represented their views in our response to East West Rail. So, you know, we absolutely go more than the extra mile on this and we'll continue to do so. Okay, so moving on, we are just asked to note that and we move on to item 11, which is the Conservation Area Review Programme, including the approach to Long Stanton Conservation Area. And this is going to be introduced and recommended by Councillor Toomey Hawkins, and I am very pleased to second it. Uh, Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, many people might not know, but here in South Cairns, we have 84 conservation areas. And um, currently of these two, of these 22 appraisals covering 24 conservation areas have been adopted. So there's still some way to go. Uh, conservation areas are all areas
is of special either architectural or historic interest. And the purpose of specifying them is not to prevent all development, but rather to enable careful management of those qualities that make them special. So each conservation area should have an appraisal, which is a set of key documents that defines what is special about the area and will help decision makers when considering planning applications. As a local plan authority, we have a statutory duty to review conservation areas from time to time. Um, and that time to time period is generally approximately five years because it's not expected that the characteristics of such an area will change rapidly. However, up to now, for us, these reviews have been done as and when resources have permitted. We recognize that we need to get on top of these and um, the shared planning service is now proposing a rolling program of appraisals. Um, you've seen in the paper that there are three criteria to enable the service prioritize how these reviews are done. Um, conservation areas where there is potential for significant development uh, comes top of the, uh, of the list. Uh, areas that are at risk, meaning that they appear on the Historic England's Heritage at Risk Register. And the third criteria is those areas with no appraisal or where the appraisal was conducted some years ago. So on the basis of this, we have set out a planned program for the next five years, as you will see in Appendix 1 in tranches. And the plan is to review that program every two years to make sure that it's on track and it's still relevant. Um, so for the period of 2021 to 2026, uh, there'll be 23 conservation area reviews which cover 22 villages, um, as you see in the report. I will note specifically um, the long-standing conservation area because that has come up um, in a request. Now, that was reviewed back in 2005 when the new town of Nosto was being considered and was making its way through the local plan process. Um, and as we have a number of other conservation areas that are much older or don't even have appraisal at all, um, we therefore consider that we should not review the Longstanton conservation area as a priority at this time. We have, you'll be pleased to know, discussed and sought the views of the parish council uh, the historic, uh, historic England and both local members about this proposal not to review constant, uh, long standing conservation area now. And all of them are happy with our approach. So we propose to leave it for now. Um, I just want to thank the officers for the work that has gone into this. Um, and I propose the recommendations in paragraphs five and six and ask the cabinet to endorse the program of conservation area appraisals. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Councillor Hawkins. Um, any cabinet members want to do a comment on this? No, anybody else? Have we got anybody in chat? Give me a moment. No, okay. Um, I've got nothing to add to uh, Councillor Toomey Hawkins' uh, introduction. Cabinet's recommended to endorse the criteria and approach for the rolling program of conservation area appraisals and management plan reviews for the program to be reviewed biannually. Uh, and B, confirm that it will not prioritise a review of long stanton conservation area at this time. Do members agree with the proposal? Anyone wish to vote against? And anyone wish to abstain? No? Did okay. need a second? Uh, I, was, I said I would second. Oh, sorry. Yes, in the introduction. Thank you. That's all right. Uh, Cabinet therefore agrees the proposal by affirmation. And moving on to item 12, which is the biodiversity supplementary planning document. And that is, again, as uh, Councillor Toomey Hawkins is going to introduce it and make the move the recommendation. And I am very happy to second it. So over to you again, Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Leader. You wait for one and you get three. Or is it four? <laughs> um, right, this is an SPD that I am excited to bring to you today. Um, our current biodiversity SPD actually dates back to 2009. And that's even before I became a councillor. And this is my 
going on 12 years, so it is a long time. Um, as you know, SPDs provide more detailed guidance on policies in the adopted local plan. And this council adopted a new local plan in 2018, and we also know that there are key changes that were made to the national planning policy framework also in 2018. So it is important that we bring our biodiversity SPD up to date. We have, as a council, committed to Dublin Nature, and we adopted our Dublin Nature strategy back in February of this year, uh, which we're very excited about. And as you also you know, the new local plan we're working on um, has biodiversity and green spaces, um, and climate change as you know themes, uh, you know two of the themes um, that govern the plan. Now, I'd like to mention that one of the big changes we have in the MPPF is the reference to measurable biodiversity net gain. And that's quite important, as it's the metric for measuring the overall diversity that you get after developing a site. So we need to incorporate this uh, as well as one of the big themes in our um, SVD. And it is, I think, a clear steer to developers that biodiversity and ecology must be considered right at the start of a project. It's not an add-on it's got to be considered from the start of the project. Now, our aim is towards 20%, as suggested, as best practice. Obviously, if we can get more, we'd be happy, <laughs> we'd be happy for more. But we also need to be um, uh, reasonable and practical. Um, I'm sure, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll leave this here for now because I'm sure that um, the chair of the Climate and um, Environment Advisory Committee will very rightly say quite a lot about this. Um, but obviously we want to now take this document out to our communities to engage with them and get their views on it. And before I stop, let me just say a big thank you to the um, Build for Natural Environment team for the excellent work that they've done and for the input that the Climate uh, Advisory Committee has had into this. It's been very, very helpful indeed. Um, and without further ado, I will move the recommendation in paragraph three and ask the cabinet to please accept this document and agree that we can take it to public consultation. And we'll come back after we've gone through that process. Thank you, Julia. Thank you very much, Councillor Hawkins. I'm going to invite Councillor Pippa Halings, who's chair of the Climate and Environment um, Advisory Committee, to speak at this point. Thank you very much and through you, um, Chair, and thank you very much to um, Councillor Toomey Hawkins, who's Cabinet Lead Member for Planning and who has worked very closely and been extremely supportive of this um, SPD. And I don't want to duplicate what um, Councillor Hawkins has said, but we are very, very supportive of this um, version of the biodiversity supplementary planning document that you have before you and that should go out to consultation. It has been worked on incredibly by the built and natural environment team and it has come to the climate change and environment advisory committee and we've looked at it in detail. What this does and we have to be very very realistic what this supplementary planning document does is to bring us up to date with the national um, planning policy framework. We were one of the few councils you know, in England to have a biodiversity supplementary planning document, which was in 2009. And our local plan that we adopted back in 2018 um, does echo some of the things that are in that supplementary planning document. But in no way does our current local plan nor the existing supplementary planning document reach our ambitions and aspirations or those of our residents um, and of many of the developers as well and those who are going to um, live in new developments and sometimes we're challenged we brought forward the doubling nature strategy we adopted it um, as a sister document to our zero carbon strategy and it lays out, it sets out our ambition and aspirations. But often we're challenged that in development, difficult developments that finally get through planning, why those ambitions are not met. And the reason is the bottom line is because we don't have the policy teeth to make sure that this is obligatory. And so 
this supplementary planning document still doesn't get us there because we have to wait one for the environment bill to be passed and two for our new local plan to be adopted in which we are very very much putting out higher ambition levels but what this document does do is it sets out the stall it makes very very clear what our aspirations ambitions are for those who want to join with us um, and it says it gives examples of some of the great stuff that's already happening and it invites everybody to say we want to meet those aspirations and ambitions but they are non-binding targets which are within this supplementary planning document because as yet we cannot make them binding but this supplementary planning document will make sure that we explain our interpretation of existing legislation it brings us up to date with biodiversity net gain and not no net loss and it ensures that everybody understands our interpretations um, so I just wanted to make that that very very clear what it does bring forward are the key roles that local nature recovery networks play the key roles that neighborhood plans and local area plans in this and the key role that um, working together with communities with our planners and with developers that given that the evidence commissioned for our new local plan shows us that Cambridgeshire is one of the poorest areas in terms of land managed for wildlife and tree canopy cover we have to be doing better at this we have we can't just wait for the local plan which will come you know in probably around two years we need something to bridge us from where the current local plan is clearly set out our stolen aspirations and clearly set out what our ambition for the new local plan is that's what policy messages do and this is what this supplementary planning document does it brings in sustainable and drainage the suds it brings in issues around water and biodiversity brings in local green spaces and the nature recovery network and it clearly clearly sets out why we think that we are not facing only a climate emergency but an ecological and climate emergency and what we aim to do about it as far as we can in terms of planning policy. And so this needs to go out to consultation with the clarity of that understanding. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. There's nothing I can add to that. That was marvellous. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, any cabinet members want to uh, make any comment on this? Uh, Councillor Milnes. Uh, just a, a very quick uh, comment over public awareness. Um, and we saw just last week with uh, uh, conversations about biodiversity net gain and um, for example the unintended consequences of some of the developments that we do to loss of species for example and so this is a it, it's a, a complementary to the climate change uh, conversation uh, and it, I, I'm really happy as a council if we are thought leaders in this regard uh, and push the agenda forward Thank you. Thank you, that's well said. Any other cabinet members? Mm, Councillor Bradman. Thank you, Leader. Um, yes, I just wanted to welcome this strategy coming forward and welcome the fact that, as uh, Councillor Hayling said, it bridges the gap between now and what we aspire to. Um, and in particular, I'm minded that, you know, doubling nature is a really important aspiration but if the starting point is something that's got very little biodiversity, which sometimes is the case with arable land, which we might be building on, then actually doubling it uh, doesn't take us to a very high target. And so I'm really pleased that this, um, that the chair of our climate change committee is so committed to really improving our performance in this and actually bringing us up to a level where we can be proud of our approach to nature. And I'm, I'm really pleased with all of that. And I'm pleased that this supplementary planning document brings us closer um, to uh, making that clear to the public what, what we care about and what we're trying to do. So good, good to see it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Are there any other speakers? Okay, so I think this is an outstanding piece of information.
um, and I said, so it's now going out to consultation and will come back to us at the end of the year. Um, what I'm very keen on is that we adopt maximum um, maximum. In, we, we make the most of the consultation opportunities. Now, I know that people in South Cambridge or in Cambridge City who are going to be uh, the focus of the consultation are very, very engaged with this, and we've got no end of um, environmental groups and bodies. So I'd like us to do some sort of targeted work getting this out to the people whose um, feedback we will, we will value on, on this. And it can certainly go out through the, no, uh, the local nature partnership um, and all those other bodies. And I think, generally speaking, people are going to be very, very pleased and send a very strong message about the level of our, our ambition. Um, so, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be talking to our comms team about what they can do as of, as of today to start raising the profile of this. So, uh, Cabinet is recommended to support the passage of this supplementary planning document through this process to the next phase, which is public consultation prior to its return to this committee for review and adoption in late 2021. Uh, will members agree with that proposal, please? Anyone wish to vote against? And anyone wish to abstain? No, so Cabinet therefore agrees the proposal by acclamation. And thank you very much, Councillor Hayling, for your contribution, which was invaluable. Uh, so moving on to the last item, which is item 13, which is the review of the design review service. And this is Councillor Toomey Hawkins again, and I believe Councillor Brian Milnes is going to second this. So, Councillor Hawkins. Oh, one minute. Some, no? Sorry, so something has appeared in here. I'm not sure I understand it. Ah, okay. Right, I'm back again. Thank you. Um, yeah, the technology review process. Um, the design review process that we've carried out um, is something that we, we needed to do. As you know, we, we are twice to get this part of um, the very important part of how we manage development um, in the district. Um, our design enabling panel here in South Cairns was set up in 2014, and it's never been reviewed. And there is as some of you might know, a minimum charge to use the service. The equivalent in Cambridge City is called the Design and Conservation Panel. It's set up in 2006, last reviewed 2014, and is a free service. So what we have now is a service, a joint service, that's got two types of design review processes, and we thought it was best to bring them down um, and um, harmonize uh, since we have a joint planning service. What the report you see before you does is presents the finding of the independent review of both panels. And it proposes to replace them with a single panel for the Greater Cambridge area that aligns with best practice and provides a consistent approach across the Greater Cambridge area. Now, this review was carried out last year. Um, and the reviewers observed the meetings of both the design and review panel um, as well as the, uh, the city version of it. And also the quality panel run by the county council, although that is not part of this review. And also the reviewers interviewed some of those who have brought schemes to our design panel in the last 12 months, as well as planning officers, planning committee members, residents associations and parish council groups pretty much talk to everyone who has anything to do with um, the, the panel or the use of the panel. I just wanted to note that the feedback you would have seen in the report of the South Cairns design panel was quite positive. Um, but yes, there's always improvement to be made. Now, out of all that review work that was done, um, in, you know, there are three strategic changes that have been proposed. The first is to create a single design um, review service with specialist sub-panels. Uh, the second is to refresh and improve how the service is delivered, um, including updating the terms of reference. And the third is to integrate the design review with the wider design planning work um, in the service as well. Um, the full report obviously is in Appendix A. 
and the replies or the proposed replies that were referenced uh, is in appendix B. There's a lot in there, um, but it's, it'll be good to note that you know it should become a pay-as-you-use -use service, um, cover its costs, and perhaps have a, a bigger panel um, of between 20 and 30 members that you can then choose your sub-panels from, you know, et cetera, et cetera, as well as an independent advisory group to govern the panel um, as part of the um, uh, recommendations. Now, the plan is that this new service will be cost neutral. Wash its face. <laughs> um, and it will be funded from charges paid by applicants. And there's potential to generate surplus, which can be reinvested back into the service. Um, just to let you know that this um, proposal was considered by the Cambridge Scrutiny and Transport um, Committee and agreed by its executive councillor, I think it was a week ago. So to close this, I just want to thank the reviewer from the Urban Design Learning for their excellent work and to everyone who has given up their time for the interviews and discussions. But I also want to say a special thanks to all of the current members of our South Camps Design and Review Panel for the service they have given to us over the years. Um, lending us the expertise and knowledge to get high quality design outcomes in our projects. And I hope I will see some of them <laughs> in that new panel. But I must also mention our urban design team, especially uh, Dr. Kwok and Tom Davis, who have administered our design team very well indeed. I therefore move the recommendation in paragraph three on page 239 of my papers. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just going to ask uh, Stephen Kelly if he wants to add anything to that. Uh, uh, thank you, Leader. No, uh, obviously um, your ambition for high quality outcomes uh, is, is paramount in what, what the planning service is trying to do. And, and this review is, is timely, I think, uh, in trying to bring together best practice across the country. Um, we're already, uh, one of the leaders in terms of quality of places that we deliver, but uh, it's important that we keep this uh, under review uh, and hopefully the recommendations uh, that Councillor Hawkins have, have, have set out can, can be supported and see the service move forward further. Thank you. Uh, right, any questions from the Cabinet? Uh, Councillor Goff. Councillor Williams first, beg your pardon. Um, th thank you, Leader. Um, well, as you know, in South Camps we have parish councils and Parish councils give their views on planning applications, and in a lot of cases, parish councils have concerns about the design of developments. And um, I think we have made great efforts, and we have come a long way in the last three years in in helping parish councils to understand the planning process and to recognise and um, try and take on board um, the comments that are made by parish councils in the planning process. I do hope that, um, that the IAG will take into account the views of parish councils when they are looking at designs and involve parish councils in their um, deliberation um, and it doesn't just become um, a, a place of professionals which exclude those who you know have to live with the eventual development so I do hope that and we talk about in paragraph 5.20 that there will be a, a, a an annual report of the panel's activities, and I hope part of that report will be um, feedback and comments from parish councils on their work. Thank you. Points well made. I'm just going to take other questions, and I will ask Mr. Kelly to come back back in. Uh, Councillor Goff. Yeah, I, actually, I'm, you know, I, I went through the uh, and read the urban design uh, learning report, which I thought was 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 very good and. It's, it contains quite a few recommendations um, to address the process of uh, how the, the, the panel works. And, and I just wanted to check that in the recommendations, we also intend to pick up 
those recommendations from the urban design living group report. So, so some of them were around process, as Councillor Williams said, in terms of the annual report. It seemed, seemed to me very sensible um, proposals to address some of the, the, the sort of weaknesses which they identified in the uh, current operation. So I just wanted to check that that was incorporated into the rec recommendation. It's not, I don't think it's ex explicit, but I just want to make sure it's in there. Thank you. Um, Councillor Batchelor. Uh, thank you, Chair. <coughs> I very much welcome uh, this report and the revisions uh, that, that it, it um, proposes. My concern is that this is still a voluntary um, thing as far as developers are concerned. Um, as next chair of the planning committee, I would very much like to see that the planning committee could actually have the power to direct um, developers to go to the design uh, panel when that committee has particular concerns about what is actually put in front of it. Um, I quite appreciate this presumably requires legislation, um, but one would hope that this government who appear, uh, who apparently want to, everything to be lovely, uh, would actually feel that the design panels could actually have a role in loveliness. Thank you. Point, point well made. Any other questions before I go to, Mr. Um, um, from, just from Cabinet? I'm going to go to Mr. Kelly first, and then I'll take questions from people outside of Cabinet. Uh, thank you, uh, Leader. Um, in response to um, uh, Councillor Williams' uh, point, I think uh, it's important to bear in mind that the design review is just part of the process of securing good development. So absolutely, it's important to hear from uh, parishes in that, in that process. Um, uh, but uh, uh, certainly the annual report uh, and the accountability of the, of the uh, design review chairs uh, for um, the advice that they provide, together with some picking up on Councillor Goff's point, some of the recommendations about how we can ensure um, effective feedback uh, and effective um, um, uh, curating of the process uh, so that it adds value to the ultimately planning committee decisions uh, and assists the planning committee uh, is important. Uh, there, there was some consideration as to whether or not a, um, uh, you know, representatives of the local community uh, could or should be part of uh, the design review process. Uh, but um, I, I think one needs to see this, as I said, in the context of the whole process in which applicants are encouraged by the NPPF, picking up on Councillor Batchelor's point, they're not compelled, but they're encouraged by the NPPF to engage in early consultation with parishes and communities. Uh, as we move forward in looking at the new local plan, Certainly, it's our expectation to try and seek to embody in policy in that document a much more uh, strident position in terms of the requirement for design review uh, and indeed to strengthen the committee and the council's arm uh, where applicants simply fail to demonstrate how they've taken on board the really important elements of the community voice, but also uh, the understanding from the design review process uh, in uh, decision making to try and empower the council and communities to, uh, if the government won't do it, uh, to uh, secure very positive participation from everybody uh, in that development process. So just a clarification, Mr. Kelly. So um, obviously, you know, the last thing we want to do is slow down planning applications. So obviously, at the point at which we publish them, they go to a, the parish councils for comment and out to the general public as well. At what point do the design enabling panel or whatever they're going to be called uh, get to do their bit of work? Is it before or is it at that same point or is it prior to that? Uh, the design enabling panel uh, routinely get involved at the pre-application phase at the scheme development because particularly with larger projects trying to uh, establish um, uh, a quality scheme right at the beginning saves both huge amounts of time and indeed avoids wasting um, public consultation and the huge energy that communities put into responding to that in schemes that are fundamentally flawed or poorly developed. But the, um, th that process of, uh, as I think Councillor Williams highlighted, 
fundamentally professional and specialist engagement needs to be seen as sitting alongside um, the important community engagement that should also be happening at the same time ahead of the application phase. Uh, and one of the things that we will want to do probably uh, as we move forward is to revisit the advice in our uh, statement of community involvement um, to capture, amongst other things, these types of really important matters for the local authority so that developers can be left, as we've discussed with the previous item, uh, in no doubt about the council's expectations for early and fulsome community participation, because sometimes it's very tokenistic, but also uh, so that uh, as we progress towards the new local plan, uh, we can um, have more effective policies that make circumstances where people do not properly participate in that early scheme development uh, more disadvantageous to the development community. In other words, that they are encouraged strongly uh, and indeed um, their failure to engage proactively as uh, a, a black mark against it in terms of planning policy. So, so it's, it's, it's one part of a process, um, but, it, but it, is, uh, it sits alongside in that pre-application phase uh, primarily um, other engagement avenues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, it be, so it, it will be good if we, uh, if we are being clearer about the need for really high quality community engagement at the pre-app stage. I've seen the, the good, the bad and the ugly of it and, and the best of it actually means that applications are very, very well accepted by, by communities because they think it's reflecting what they, they've said they're saying. Um, and that is important, but I think we need to uh, levy some weight on developers to make sure that uh, they, are do they are doing that well. Uh, Councillor Milnes. Um, I, don't, I don't know whether you, uh, you, you want to invite me to speak as a seconder of this, um, but the, um, the situation uh, Stephen Kelly uh, describes is um, pertinent to uh, an example I have in um, Salford at the moment with 200 um, uh, new housing, uh, a new house estate, um, and they're going through pre-application and consultation ex exercise. They've incorporated um, village design guide work in that. And I see this very much as a, a Kaizen, continuous improvement of an existing uh, system. Uh, and the review process that's incorporated in here speaks very well to that. Uh, we've got, you know, in many respects, precious assets uh, assets of precious environment uh, to look after in this uh, uh, wider Great Cambridge area. And if this can add to the way that we protect that, uh, we've got award-winning designs uh, already in, in the area. Uh, we want to continue that and uh, cope with those uh, dilemmas that we often face in planning terms uh, with conflicting in interests. So I recommend this to the, uh, uh, to the Cabinet. Thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, so if there's no more questions from Cabinet, I'll go to other, other speakers. Uh, Councillor Bradnam first, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, so I hope you'll bear with me. I've got a few points I wanted to make. Firstly, I have actually had the privilege of observing a couple of design enabling panels um, for South Cairns in process, which was a very interesting experience. And I wanted to thank uh, Bonnie Kwok for her work in running those in a very professional way that attracts um, influential design, pe people with expertise in design to, to sit on those panels. So that's really important. Um, also, I am this year chair of Joint Development Control Committee, which looks at developments across the boundary between the city and South Cams. And so I'm very mindful of the sometimes differing requirements of developments in the urban area, in the fringe and in the rural area. Um, and I'll just come on to that in a minute, but I also wanted to endorse uh, Councillor John Batchelor's point about will it be voluntary? Because I do note that there are some even small developments which I think would benefit enormously from atten attending the design enabling panel or having them thinking about it. Because actually sometimes small developments can be very influential when they're in the middle of a small village. And so actually I think it would be very nice if we could encourage um, 
all sizes of developers to actually go through the design enabling panel uh, and perhaps with costs proportionate uh, to the time involved in looking at their developments. Um, but certainly I would like to be in a position where we could encourage them more to take part in that. Um, I can think of one particular example of a singularly ugly development that was one on its own, which is a complete blot on the landscape. And I, I'm astonished that nobody ever stopped it. But anyway, I won't uh, embarrass the village in question with that one. But the last item is this point about it being sympathetic to the differing needs of um, the urban and fringe and rural development. So whilst it's whilst we had um, separate panels, they were mindful of the needs of for us in our situation a broadly rural community. Whereas I'm aware that the design plans and the design culture for the city of Cambridge is really very urban and it has become increasingly um, high, tall and quite dense of necessity. And, and many of those developments have been excellent and are well uh, appreciated and liked and are good places to live and they work really well. But I, I just want to be for our design enabling panel and as you say, whatever it is called, to be mindful of the slightly differing needs when we're looking at rural developments, you know, ed edges of our villages or between our villages, to be clear that there are different requirements there. Um, and I'm hoping that they can take into account the, the previous paper we talked about with the, um, the biodiversity supplementary planning document that they can also have been mindful that those needs can be brought into these designs as well. So I'm just it's just a plea that those panels be mindful of the differing needs of the urban and the rural environment. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So I think we've uh, we you know we've heard that the uh, from Mr. Kelly that we are going to be doing our utmost to encourage um, developers to engage with this, though we can't mandate it. Um, and I, 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 what my take from the presentation originally was that the reason for there being a large pool of experts from which to draw, which will include uh, far more people with an environmental background, will mean that the actual panels will, uh, will reflect the needs of each application much better. So that's the reason not to have a small you know, pool that's very focused on urban, it's to have a much bigger pool with considerable expertise and therefore you know, it will meet all of, our, all of our needs. Do you want to add anything to that, Mr Kelly? Uh, thank you, Linda. Well, just to say, I mean, as you see, one of the decisions that we are making is rather than have this independently managed, is to manage it in-house uh, with our own staff to help curate the process of ensuring, as the leader highlighted, the right range of professionals are in the room uh, for that uh, design review. The other thing that's important to note is, of course, the design review panel is not the planning committee. Uh, and, um, you know, sovereignty over decisions rests with officers in the planning committee um, for the outcomes. Uh, but absolutely, the whole point of broadening out uh, and, in, and indeed uh, re-appointing um, uh, panel members is to gain uh, that broad church of expertise, but to make sure that the right people are deployed for the right project, whether that's a city project or a uh, South Cam's uh, or fringe project. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to Councillor Daunton now. Um, thank you, Lida. I have two comments and a question. Um, my, my first comment is a, a paragraph 5.25 on page 249. And I'm delighted to see the suggestion that fees may be reduced by up to 50% where the service wants to support community organizations, charities, and small businesses. I'm, I think that's a very good move. Um, and I hope that that will, be, will indeed be adopted. Um, and then on page 251 um, at uh, 5.31, I would add visibility to that paragraph because I think uh, a really important move forward would be to make uh, the panel more visible, uh, both the membership and the terms of reference. I see that there will be a dedicated web page and I hope that attention will be drawn to um, the membership of the panel and the work that it does. And then my question is uh, 5.32. 
Um, I'm, I'm delighted to see that um, there will be um, a, uh, sorry, no, it's not, it's a, a paragraph 13 on uh, page two, uh, 253 um, uh, under equality and diversity. I'm really glad to see that recruitment will encourage applications from people with protected characteristics. I'm, I'm also hoping uh, that people who are younger in the professions concerned might be given a chance to be involved. I think it would be really good to, to hear um, younger voices and, and also to give younger people in the professions um, the opportunity to be exposed to the work in detail, the work of the design panels. Um, so maybe that could be taken into account. Thank you. Uh, so I'm particularly interested in your last point. I was at a presentation some time ago on Zoom by uh, the sort of the younger age range of the Cambridge Ahead, which represents, I think, the, the top 40, 50 businesses in Cambridge. And this was a pre uh, presentation from young professional people about what, what they wanted in housing and places and quality of life. And it was extremely interesting and very, a very, very high caliber piece of work. So I think we might go and talk to Cambridge ahead, possibly, and to that uh, that younger person's arm uh, to see what uh, what you know what they suggest there. But it's an excellent point because at the end of the day, we are planning for the future of our young our young people. Um, okay, uh, Mr. Kelly, do you want to add anything before we wind this up? Uh, thank you, Lydia. I mean, we can certainly take on board, um, uh, and as you can see, the team are very mindful of the ambition of attracting. Um, a range of, uh, of panel members rather than perhaps a single kind of uh, more traditional cohort where we might expect to draw resources. So um, the team, uh, you'll, you'll see there is an appointment process that we're, we're planning on going through and certainly we can take on board uh, all, all of your comments. Whether or not we'll approach Cambridge ahead, I think um, we will, what we will be doing is seeking to talk to the professions themselves directly, Landscape Institute, RTPI and so on who all have young member chapters and perhaps see if we can start to uh, tease out and invite applications from those people with that broader uh, perspective, but uh, who may well uh, uh, not only have protected characteristics, but, but others who may well be younger. Super, that's, that's very reassuring. Thank you very much for bringing that up, Councillor Thornton. Um, okay, so I, back in 2014, I, was, I worked with Bonnie Crock to uh, recruit an outstanding chair of the design enabling panel at that time so it's uh, it's very exciting that this is getting a really really major refresh uh, so the recommendations are at page 239 i'm not going to read them all out because they're quite long uh, do members agree with the proposal anyone voting against anyone abstaining nope. so cabinet therefore agrees the proposals by affirmation so um, we've now reached the, the uh, end of the agenda. Thank you ever so much to those people who've joined remotely and in person. And just to note that the next meeting of Cabinet is scheduled to pay, take place on Friday the 30th of July at 10 o'clock. Thank you very much indeed. And if we could stop the live stream.